So basically we're on Barton Broad and it occurred to me that some time ago I did a blog about Omega, Brinks, Brinks Omega. And in that blog I didn't say anything but we came to Barton Broad and suddenly um, there was this rousing music and we did a left or maybe it was a right, I'm not sure. And we ended up going somewhere where then people in sort of forums and Facebook groups had spoken of before and it pops up every now and again and people will say oh Rob did a video of that or something like this it's called Woods End State and at the time I didn't want to make a big deal about it I kept it quite quiet and it was just like there it is okay find it for yourself so now I'm on Barton Broad and it's absolutely empty and serene and I thought why don't I take you down there and show you where it is um, and then you can go there yourselves but don't all rush there because I do get people say to me you know oh it's all very well you're doing these nice videos Rob but then you know we don't want to spoil we don't want like hordes of people turning up and I must point out that it is a very small mooring it's just one single mooring it's about 30 to 35 foot long you, there are no mooring posts you need to bring your own anchors okay but it is legal mooring it's not a private do not moor mooring so you can you can go there kind of thing but all around it is other private mooring so you really have to make sure you know where you're allowed to moor otherwise you know you'll get in trouble so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and show you where it is on Bart Broad uh, so you don't get lost see so a friend of mine Alan hello um, he owns a boat up here on the on the Norfolk Broads Orca you know Orca the Jaws film yeah um, he lives on a boat. He's a competent boaty man. He's got navigation aids like sonar and spotlights and stuff. And yet, he came on Spartan Broad, he took the wrong turning, God only knows how, ended up up some private dike and in someone's sort of back garden. So, um, Alan, <laughs> yes, you're being mentioned in the blog. So, viewers, don't do an Alan and go and get lost on Barton Broad. I'll help you. I'll show you where to go. So just for your information, on our left hand side is the island. Okay, I'm going to go around the island, come back up towards Stalham, so you can orientate yourself, and then we'll, we'll go and show you where it is. Now while I'm talking about Barton Broad, there's a bunch of areas on Barton Broad that please don't go. Don't just think you can, but Generally speaking, on the main part of the Broad, not down by Turkey Broad or near to the island, because uh, that is very shallow, and not up towards Gay Stade, because that's shallow outside of those posts, on, especially on the left-hand side. But you can go outside of the posts. In fact, I would recommend that if you're going to mud weight on Barton, um, one of the best locations is just as you come onto Barton Broad from the Salem direction, left hand side, big wide area outside the posts, put your mud weight down there. Don't mud weight on Barton if it's really strong winds, it's since they sort of did all the dredging back in sort of 2000, 2001 I think it was, um, you can easily drag a mud weight on Barton, it's a very open broad, it hasn't got much shelter. So, um, if high winds are forecast, bear that in mind. Um, you might not end up where you put your mud weight down. <laughs> so, um, what I'm going to do is, I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this that easily. So, because the cameras I've got on the outside of the boat distort perspective slightly. So, but I'll try, okay? And I'll talk you through it of where to go. So let's put them on now and we'll see where we are. When you come to this post, I don't know what it's stuck on there for. That probably won't be there when you're here kind of thing. But there is a dike you'll see on your right hand side. And so you go outside the post here So we've just come past the island on our left hand side. And as you turn, you will then see an opening in the reeds. Now 
you want to take this nice and slow, you don't want to come in here at five mile an hour or anything. It is shallow, keep to the centre, there's tree roots and stuff on either side. Follow it up, it will curve around a bit. And the mooring you're allowed to use is the first mooring on the right hand side, nowhere else. I'm literally just drifting in neutral here. It's quite tight as you can see, there could be boats moored ahead of you. Those are the private moorings. And I would actually say that the, the, the size of the mooring is not 35 feet. I will show you. So that is Woods End Stave. That little bit there with that dinghy, just there, not here. So I hope that's cleared that up. So I'm just backing out here, behind us is Barton Broad. And hopefully you can see you don't need bow thrusters and you can steer in reverse. just need to plan your turns far more in advance. Perspectively, if I want to go more to the left, like we are now, I turn the wheel to the right, full lock, and then I turn it all the way full lock to the left, to head perspectively to the right over here. Now the more power we put on, the faster the boat will react as you can see. So now I'm turning the wheel to the right. Again, the broads are a great place. The actual broads, like here at Barton, is a great place to experiment because you're not going to crash into anything. Well, hopefully you're not. Yeah, just avoiding that post. And you can quite easily control the boat but it does take more time it's 
not even a half of what you get compared to going forward with control and it depends on what boat, the hull shape, the rudder shape, the propeller pitch, so many things. This boat sort of works. Broad ambition with a huge rudder and four blade prop um, really does steer very well backwards. Now we're coming out of the channel, onto the main road. Back into neutral, and I'll put it in forward. And that's the location there for reference of the dike. So really and truly, when I said to you earlier about a 30, 35 foot boat, um, I wouldn't want to moor this boat. This is 39 foot, no way. You really want to have literally probably a 30 foot max to be able to fit on that stave comfortably. They are private moorings around there. They may wish to have their boats to be able to have access to those, but it is a public mooring, it's not Broads Authority owned, I think it's the District Council um, that owns the land. So um, it's there, it's on maps, it's navigable, I don't think it should be kept secret secret. But having said that, several thousand people watch these blogs. So use your common sense, if you've got a big boat, don't think, oh yeah, I'll go down there. I've just realised um, what this boat reminds me of is a ferry. You're like, what the fuck bloody loopy. But no, um, the reason why is, you know when you're on a ferry, or even a big passenger river boat, and you're downstairs, and you can hear this sort of rumble of the engine, and the, the roof and the fittings sort of give this creak and noise. With this boat, because the engine is so quiet, you don't actually really hear the engine, you hear the resonance of the engine, um, which is quite a low frequency. It sounds actually like it's got an enormous engine with a you know, very well silenced exhaust system. Um, so you don't get the sort of clatter of the diesel but then you hear this sort of, you know, the creaks of stuff and the steering wheel and, you know, the resonance of, of the actual saloon. And it actually sounds just the same as when you're on a big, powerful ferry and, you know, it's like this little vibration going along. It's incredibly powerful. And also, I suppose, because of the way that the helm is set up, when you're underway, you can't see the bow of the boat, which sounds a negative, but it's actually fine because it's, it's not very far ahead of you. So you only really need to worry about where that is when you're mooring up and you just stick your head out the window. But everything is very smooth and disconnected. Now I don't mean that in a, in a negative way of like, you know, the, you don't get any feedback. But the steering wheel and the hydraulic steering, you can move it with your little finger, it's amazing. But it's not just that, the throttle isn't connected to the engine with any cable. Even with boats, um, like forward steer boats where you've got the engine at the back and the throttle, you'll have the sound travel down the throttle cable to the throttle station and you'll have this like noise of the diesel engine as a kind of a high frequency rattle coming through the throttle it's like this you know diddly 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 noise but this is an electronic throttle so there is no connection it's just sending signals and the travel of the throttle arm is is incredibly smooth and dampened it's a bit like a soft closing toilet lid where it just comes down in an even way um, so to move the throttle is incredibly easy so everything's just quiet and smooth and you just feel like you could just go miles and miles and miles in absolute comfort you can have a really low level nice chat with people here there's no um, 
noise from the engine, from the diesel itself, there's no vibrations. The whine of the hydraulically driven motor is, is very well suppressed on this boat as well, just coming up to the advanced height marker, 8 foot 3 at Ladden Bridge. Um, so yeah, it is the quietest boat, apart from Brink's Rhapsody, when that was underway under electric, that I've ever been on. It's quite um, amazing how, you know, engines, their smoothness, insulation materials now, that you can get this refinement in, in higher cruisers. And for some reason, I don't know why, but I was just thinking then of, of my past, of how it's now coming up to 10 minutes past 8, so we're approaching Ludden Bridge. We started our day at Dillon, we came down there, we did our little bit on Barton Broad, and it's still only 10 past 8, and we've, we've covered all this distance, which is another great reason to get up early and, and you know, explore. And it reminds me of when I was a kid, um, you know, way back in the day and stuff, Let's go down memory lane. And by the way, blog viewers, there's going to be a segment now where I'm just going to be talking. So if you don't like the talking, this is the point where you can click forward on the YouTube timeline and get past my talking. Okay. Now those that want to have a nice little story about Robin's childhood, sail on round, make yourself comfortable in a circle. Here we go. So basically, um, as a child, obviously, uh, coming on the broads, um, with my parents, getting up and getting away in the morning was never going to happen early because my mum would have to do breakfast, my dad would have to get ready and nothing could happen until he was finished getting ready and he would get ready in such a unique way. I just go into the bathroom and I might, you know, have a shower, brush my teeth, have a shave, come out, I'm done, let's get ready, let's get the day underway. But my dad would go in there and he'd first of all have to have a wash and then he'd come out and shave because he used an electric shaver. Um, and that went on for a long time because both him and I are blessed with the lovely stubble that just grows back in the day. So um, you have to do it. Whereas I wet shave um, and it's much quicker and smoother and nicer I think. Anyway, so we do that. And then he'd have to go back in and brush his teeth, which he would use an electric toothbrush for because the dentist told him they're better, but he didn't want to give up his manual toothbrush, so he brushed his teeth twice, once electric, once manual, and then he'd floss his teeth. So once that was finished with, then he would have to go and wash his hair, because if he had a shower, he'd always wear a shower cap, but then he'd wash his hair with a jug, <laughs> bending over the sink. <laughs> so. This would all take a lot of time and it would be the same order, the same habit, whether it be at home, in a hotel, on a boat, whatever. And while this was going on, my mum would be preparing breakfast, but she couldn't do too much because there'd be the signal, right, okay, 10 minutes, you know, get the bacon on, and that would happen. So then we'd, we'd sit down and eat our breakfast, watching all the other boats going past on their merry ways, and then we still could go because my mum would have to wash the dishes, but my dad would say, oh, that was a lovely breakfast, I have to let that get down. So that'd be another half an hour wait. And finally we'd get underway. And if we'd moored at, say, let's say, Powell Hill, and we went to Roxham, by the time we got to Roxham, then it was basically shopping, that's all. Go to the butchers, go to Roy's, and everything else, but it would be slow shopping, laborious shopping, looking at stuff shopping, looking at stuff you can get everywhere else, but we must look at it nonetheless. So by the time we come back to the boat from Roy's, it's sort of afternoon and it's time for a sandwich. But you see, with my dad, this is actually quite a good tip actually, if you're doing any sandwich that involves cucumber and you're not preparing it fresh, I know this sounds weird, but it does work actually. Cut your cucumber and wrap it in foil, separate to your sandwich. Then the cucumber doesn't go soggy, and your sandwich doesn't get soggy from the cucumber. It really works. So, anyway, after having the sort of sandwich for lunch and stuff, especially out of season, you know, you're getting to the point where you're thinking, well, where can we go now? And we sort of make for hauling and that'd be it. That would be the day done. So, um, when I started coming on the broads, sort of on my own and stuff, just have to check here. We're going through London Bridge, don't want to bloody crash the damn thing, do we? 
There we are, lined up nice and straight. So, um, yeah, I was amazed how much I could fit in and do during the day compared to when we were out as a family. So, um, and then I stopped coming on the broads, you know, for a while, and then it was like my 18th birthday, I think. I paid for Westminster Bridge, because I was working then, and it was a treat for my mum and dad to have Westminster Bridge from Bridgecraft to Acorn. Lovely boat. And um, I could decide where we went and what we did, because I paid for the boat. <laughs> like, freedom at last. But um, just just to be able to get up and underway or even just sort of have your breakfast while you're underway. It's very different when you're on your own, you know, you're solo helming. Because um, obviously you can't do those things. And I tend to, when I'm on the broads, not look after myself too much. Um, don't drink enough. Don't eat enough. Just have like one meal a day sort of thing. Because I'm just taking it all in and cruising and you know stuff like that. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. <clears throat> so we're just coming through London Bridge, as you're aware. So we're not very far now from the mouth of River Ram, and then we'll turn left, and then I've got to remember how to moor up and tie ropes. And so far on this boat, I've been doing really well. I've remembered me knots. Um, but yeah, I haven't had any calamities yet. There's always time for that. I've got a more. I've got to go. By the way, in destination today is Acle, Acle Bridge Inn. Go to the Bridge Inn. Be having a meal there. Be meeting John um, from the Norfolk Broads Forum. That's NorfolkBroadsNetwork.com. Um, and he wants to have a little look see around this boat as well. A bit of a boat geek like me, he is. But yes, um, the Norfolk Broads Network, MBN, has been going for a long time now, since 2007. Um, and over that time, over that period of time, it's come on leaps and bounds as a resource. And I think the number one good thing about it, and I'm not connected to it, you know, I, I'm, I'm a member of it. I'm not... I do things to support it. I've got, you know, banners on the boat that, that spread the word and I'll talk to you guys about it. But that's just because I'm passionate about what it does and can, can give to you as, as a place, as a community. Um, I like the Facebook groups. I use the Facebook groups, you know, and then there's many of them. But let's if, if we take a couple of them, like Love the Norfolk Broads or Norfolk Broads Boaters, okay? So you join up and you get accepted and you're out on the rivers and you let's say I'm going to St Bennett's today and I take a picture of St Bennett's and I post it to the Facebook group and I say a short thing about that, okay? Or I'm in a pub and I've had this excellent meal and I take a picture of the food and I post it. There's a lot of people that, that will get that notification on their smartphone. They don't have to log in, it's there, they're already logged in. They look at that and they go, oh, you know, such and such has posted this. And then they can like it, they can share it, they can comment it really easily, really quickly, right there. And that's great. And I think it's really helped to promote the area, the broads. But what I refer to these, especially in main season, as topic bombs. Basically, you post something at, let's say, 12 o'clock. And by quarter past 12, that might have 15, 20 likes. And he might have had, say, nine or ten comments in a very short space of time because you've posted some new content and people are eagerly, hungrily eating it up and commenting on it. However, someone else in that intervening time has also posted something else. So then that's come to the top of the pile. And that's attracting likes and comments and, and it's, it's going down the list. And it's very linear and difficult because of the way Facebook is and, and works, to go back, you just scroll, scroll, scroll. I'm sure it's here somewhere, I'm sure it's here somewhere. Ah, yes, it's here. It's not topicked. It's not like, ah, this this here is posted about top pubs, uh, food reviews, food pictures. You can't group it like that. 
and that's where a forum, an online community, comes up trumps against Facebook. Because you can have subdivided categories specifically about something, for example, where to eat. And you can click that and you'll go there and then you'll find the content you're looking for and you post it. Now, you might post something at 12 o'clock and you won't get sort of, you know, 15 comments and so many likes within sort of 15 minutes. But what you will get is a deeper interaction. People will say more because they've got the space to say more and they can attach more to that. So it's more of a, a juicy conversation. And because of that, and because of the way it's run, in a really friendly, open manner, the moderation team over on the MBN are really, I think, do a very hard job, but a very fair job. So there's a lot of scope for debate. There's a lot of scope for opinions to be shared about the topic, in agreement, not in agreement. I think some of the Facebook groups, they want to concentrate solely and purely on the positives. So for example, if you've had bad experience and you post your bad experience, you might have a few people agree with you about that bad experience and they share their bad experiences and then you'll have an overwhelming majority that might say, well, I've had nothing but good things to say about that, blah de blah de blah And then it will be something that will go, okay, that's gone on enough. There's a few heated words going on now. So we're going to stop commenting being allowed on this post. It will stay there, usually, without being removed. But you cannot then add to it, add to the debate. On the Norfolk Broads network, you can continue to debate. And a topic may be paused while the moderation team look into stuff and reinstated. But it's very unlikely that a topic will be closed, stopped, you can't say anything about that. And that's what I like about it. I like about the fact that it doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, what your beliefs are, you're welcome. You're not going to be judged. So because of all of that, that's why I'm sort of, you know, this season thinking, you know, there's the, the meet at South House, for example, that's coming up. That's huge attendees that have, you know, put their names down on their boats and who's coming and stuff. And all the moorings are reserved. And what I'm going to try and do this year is not just have a point where people can necessarily turn up in a boat and talk to their friends online but some things extra that may be going on to make it a social event so check it out basically have a look at um, the website you don't need to sort of interact too much you don't have to um, you know discuss things you can just read things but there's going to be a lot of changes coming in the coming months and stuff and hopefully the go-to place for all the information in a simple laid out place. It's going to be like the broad social network. Oh, what's the best time to cross to go to Braden? I've got it there. What's the height of London Bridge usually? I've got it there. What's the best pub for dogs? Ah, oh, yeah, I've got it here. You know, it's not just going to be a conversation. It's going to be a resource. So um, exciting times ahead for that. And isn't it lovely in this day and age that we have these channels of communication and sharing, whether it be Facebook, NBN's also got a Facebook group, <coughs> but just about communicating and sharing. People are doing videos, people are doing video blogs. Young people, you know, on their holidays with their parents, individuals that ask me questions about you know what camera have you got how do you do this what do you reckon about that it's all about sharing a general overseeing love of a very special part of the country can't be a bad thing what is a bad thing is once i start talking bloody hell don't i go on <laughs>